Hello and welcome to Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. I'm your host, Will Bachman, and I am thrilled to be here today with Nick Gray, who is, number one, the founder of this it's this company that I love called Museum Hacks. He's now sold it. We'll talk about that a bit. And uh, that's absolutely awesome. I totally recommend Museum Hacks. And he's also the author of The Two-Hour Cocktail Party, How to Build Big Relationships with Small Gatherings. Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here and to speak about, <clears throat> sorry, Museum Hack and my book. I think it's so cool you heard about Museum Hack. That makes me so happy. Oh, man. We got to get into it. We'll get into that. But I want to talk about your book first, and then we'll talk about Museum Hacks, because I'm really curious at the story there. Um, so let's start with, you recommend the best nights to schedule a party are not Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday's not a good day because that's people's, but Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Tell me about that and tell me about how you got into scheduling and organizing cocktail parties. Yeah, it's totally wild. The The best day to host a party is probably not the day that you think. Um, I'm going to put you on blast here for a second. I'm going to do a pop quiz to you. All right. Because I'm a ready. lot of my I'm work. Ready. Oh, okay, good. A lot of my work, I'm working with people to try to get them to host their first party because most people don't host parties or they do, but it's for a birthday party or something. What do you think is the number one fear that somebody has before they host a party? No one will show up. That's my fear. Ex right? That nobody will show up. That's, that's exactly right. That's everybody's fear. Sure. And when you host a party, here's the secret, here's the hack. When you host a party on a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday night, what I call non-red level days, those days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night, are not socially competitive. People's calendars are more free, they're more flexible, and you also get to end the party early because it's a school night, right? It's a work night. And so that's part of one of my secrets as well, that these parties are only two hours long. That's right. So I'm totally on board with that. And I felt sorry for uh, your acquaintance who you talk about in the book, who their first party they scheduled for the first cocktail party they tried to organize. <laughs> they, they scheduled it for New Year's Eve. That's yes. what, like, I'm going to go learn how to play football. And I think I'll start by, you know, playing in the Super Bowl. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? And, and, you know, some people do that because they're talking to their significant other and they say, you know what, honey? We should host a 4th of July party this year. We've mm -hmm. never hosted a party before, but we're going to host a 4th. And, like, you're you're trying to go right from high school football straight to the Super Bowl. That's right. crazy. Yeah. So it's baby steps. Try maybe a, June, a June 4th party, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> I exactly. Mean, not even a May the 4th party because, you know, that's like a whole Star Wars thing going on. But, like, June 4th. No one does June 4th. That's funny. May yeah. the 4th would be good. It's right next to Cinco de Mayo, too. Yeah, so, okay, so let's talk a bit about, you know, um, the, the obvious question I got to start with here is you wrote this whole book. I don't know when you started writing a book, but, I mean, you really kind of launched this into a bit of a challenging little upwinds market here with COVID. Um, yeah. And uh, what is your take we're going to get into the you know mechanics of parties and why to do parties but let's start with the thing people are probably on people's minds is how are you handling covid giving people a covid test or something you know parties in the area of covid great question well uh, covid is definitely real and it is something that should be on people's radar but i'm leaving it up to everybody to make their own um, individual decisions about how they want to handle that um, I think that, yeah, I think that's what I'm going to say about it, because some people are very sensitive and, and very sort of careful and they prefer to host a patio outside in their backyard or sort of on a patio. Um, other people like myself, um, I'm vaccinated and boosted. I got all that stuff and I'm happy to gather indoors and have my friends open. But maybe I will crack a window or leave a fan on to make sure that there's ventilation. Uh, suffice to say, the bigger problem is that we've forgotten how to gather and that we're awkward and that post COVID people are just a little awkward and we're more lonely and we've forgotten how to make new friends. And that's what I hope my book can really help people with. You know, nobody teaches adults how to make new friends. That's crazy. 
You know, I think you're right. Um, and in fact, a lot of adults, uh, you know, people I've spoken with on, on this show and just in, 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 you know, personal conversations, I think people, you know, people, particularly as people get into middle age, they start realizing they've spent so much time on either their career, focusing on family, that they're not spending as much time and, you know, have lost touch with a lot of their friends and the number of friendships is declines. It's a, it's a problem for a lot of people. So let's say, so, you know, the audience of this show is primarily independent management consultants. Some people might be thinking about how do I organize an event that might, you know, be good for business development or might connect me with, with clients or, you know, just other potential, you know, useful connections. But um, let's get into some of the basics of uh, you want to organize a party for whatever reason. Uh, talk me through your sort of three-week checklist of preparing and just how to go about doing it. And you have a whole kind of methodology that you've tested in your book. Yes, yes. And I know that your listeners are business-focused. They are career business owners and executives. So I'm going to give them an easy way because they're busy, and I'll tell them an easy way how to remember what my party formula is all about, and it's the Nick party formula, like N-I-C-K. N stands for name tags. You always got to use name tags. I can talk more about that, but I feel pretty strongly about name tags are necessary. I am a huge I fan. Am... I'm a huge fan of name tags. And Oh, yes, yes. yeah. Can we talk about it? Why? Why do you like name tags or why oh. do you use them? So... I historically was not like a big going to party kind of person or organizing party, but my wife is much more social and roughly 20 years ago, we started, you know, organizing gatherings. So personally on our personal side, we organize gatherings. Yeah. And then for Umbrex, we organize a lot of events, uh, we organize, uh, in-person mixers throughout the world. We do yes. about 40 a year. Um, name tags are huge because they help. They just sort of take a lot of the pressure off, particularly if you already kind of know the person, but you forgot their name. It's super embarrassing. It helps yes. you reinforce it. You see their name. You can say their name. People love to hear their name. And yes. I will put in the show notes, You, we have we can have competing ones. If you have a favorite name tag, Nick, yes. you can put in there. <laughs> but I have a favorite name tag, and people always say, oh, I love this name tag. It's a kind you can get that has this little tiny magnet that puts in behind your shirt so you don't have to put a pin through your shirt and you also don't have this stupid oh. looking thing over your neck, right? Like this. Oh. Yes. And it's not like a crappy little thing that sticks on your shirt. So this is the name tag to get, my friends. And you got to print them out ahead of time, not handwritten. So print them out and make the first name a big, big font and the last name a tiny little font. That is my name tag. Philosophy. I can tell that you are an expert because you have an opinion <laughs> and a strong opinion. I'm a name and tag say, connoisseur. A I'm a name tag connoisseur. So, so okay. That is, so. A, that is a pro move. I love this. All right. Um, I have a question. I know the podcast about me, but can you tell me about those events you host for Umbrex? You said you host dozens of them. Yeah, we've hosted hundreds of events. So, sure, I'm happy to share. So, we do. Um, so we'll do Umbrex events uh, for members of our community. We'll also invite some folks who not yet joined. It's free to join Umbrex. It's for independent management consultants, and we'll organize an event in you know Atlanta, D.C., London, Munich, Berlin, Paris, wow. all over the place. You know San Francisco, wow. L.A. And we typically for those we'll invite people who are in the local area. Um, at least our experience, which is different than, than what you're recommending because of our unique, unique crowd is historically we've usually done them on a Thursday night, usually. Yes. Because yes. a lot of our crowd is traveling Monday through Thursday, at least historically pre-COVID, right? And then okay. Friday and Saturday they want to spend with their family because maybe they're on the road. But Thursday seemed to be the best night for my, you know, my kind of people, right? So we do it Thursday night um, for New York, which is our biggest – concentration of folks we will usually rent a space um wow where, you know we'll rent a space um recently we did a nice rooftop event we've done uh it, that was pretty awesome actually a nice rooftop people you know open air people feel more comfortable and then we normally yeah. will not get professional caters but we sort of do do-it-yourself catering so we hire someone nice. who just can you know 
be like a bartender. We'll go out and go to, you know, Costco or some Italian place and buy a bunch of just hors d'oeuvres. I'm a big, you know, agree with you on not serving dinner, but just you want to have people right. moving around. So the big point is I totally agree with you. You want to have people moving around, not seated at a dinner because yeah. that's super boring. So particularly a larger event, you want people to circulate. So we always try to make that feasible and we definitely do name tags. In smaller cities, what we do is if you're only going to have like six, eight, ten people, um, it doesn't really make sense to rent a whole space. So we'll either try to get a private room at a restaurant or what often works yep. well is we'll, we'll try to get like a high table at a like a wine bar kind of place that's not loud. So we really try to focus on finding some place that's going to be you know quiet enough. And if it's a high table where there's some hors d'oeuvres, people can still stand around it and mingle and you know talk to each other. So that's sort of the most practical thing we found for smaller cities. Because you know your book, you recommend doing it at your house, which I totally love. But if you're going to try to organize an event in D.C. or Chicago or San Francisco, you know live there. You know, that's that's one way to do it, right? Right. And you've got a good system and a good process. I'm not going to tell you definitely how to change what what you know that works. But what I hope that both you and I can share is that for the average listener listening to this, you've seen how it can help grow a business by hosting these events. Now, just imagine what it can do for you personally when you host an event for your friends, neighbors, even for your colleagues, this is an easy formula. So you are like the advanced reader. This book was not written for you, but I'm willing to bet that most listeners do not host as many events as you do. And more people should because it's a lot of fun. You know? And they really should, right? Yes. It's a, and it's, it's a bit of a muscle, I'd say. Don't start with the big thing, but we started, yes. you know, you mentioned New Year's. <laughs> As like, yes. we actually yeah. started doing a New Year's Eve party, um, my wife and I, when yep. after our son was born, and we're not going to be able to go out because he's nine months old, right? And, and this was back in 2005. So we said we organized a small gathering for New Year's Eve, and people came. It was nice because it was other families with kids, young kids, that didn't also want to yep. go out, right? No babysitter on New Year's Eve. And then the next year it was a little bigger. And then like the following year, we started renting a space and we did it for about 12 years. And, you know, there were usually wow. 100 plus people on New Year's Eve. But um, you want to work wow. your way up to something like that and not just say <laughs> the very first time because there's all these little things like what kind of food do you serve and how do you keep it fun yep. and how do you have some, you know, things for people to do and, and make it exciting. So anyway, over to you. You're the expert. Lead us on. We only got through well, in. I'm we so only got through name tags. Mentioned... <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Sorry. I'll go back to the form. But I'm so glad that you mentioned that hosting is like a muscle because I think you nailed it. And you are, you clearly know I'm focused on and I'm trying to reach people who really don't have any hosting muscles, who actually are a little bit shy or anxious about the idea for hosting because. One thing that I've found and the reason I wrote this book was I got so many benefits from hosting these little gatherings, from bringing people together. It helped me grow my network, get more clients and even launch my business. And the secret is anyone can do it. All it takes is, you know, a two hour cocktail party. Now, you may be listening to all of Will's events and saying, I'm ready to do what he's done for Umbrex for my business. My suggestion is, yes, absolutely do that. But start by hosting something small for your friends and neighbors so you can build that muscle that he talked about. Yeah, what no, do you I think agree. about that? No, I totally agree. Just, you know, start start small. And I might actually argue start even smaller than, than you suggest. But I mean, we can get into your suggestions of doing something in your living room, in your house. I mean, an even smaller step would be to say, Hey, let's you know pick a breakfast place and organize a four or five people to meet up for a breakfast or something. So you could start even smaller and just get the mechanics right. of sitting out event, sitting out invitations, and curating the group, right. and, and just like the mechanics of letting people know, okay, you're confirmed or not. And but uh, but let's get into your recommendation. I totally am supportive yeah, sure. of this, and uh, it, and I'm okay. Before we before I get it, I do I do got to ask you one question though. You know people write books for all different reasons. What yeah. 
you know, it, it, there's, it's not clear. I mean, what, what's, what's the benefit for you of being known as like the party guy? Like, you know, some people will write books so they can get, be an expert on a space and then get hired to be a right. consultant or something. So, I mean, people aren't going to be hiring you probably as a party consultant, I guess. So, right. so what, what drove you to put this? I mean, there's a lot of work. This book's pretty good and a lot of work went into it. All these checklists and nice you know, drawings and comics and, and quotes and stuff. So what, what was, what's the story behind it? Yeah, I yeah. What is the story, right? I spent over forty thousand dollars producing this book, and writing it, and working on it over five years, and countless hours and weeks and months. Why am I doing this? Well, to tell you why, the short answer is is maybe I'm just like I'm crazy. I don't know exactly why I'm doing it. I'm not trying to sell anything, but in order to talk about why I'm doing it, I have to go back to Museum Hack and okay. just make that as a reference because. My last company was called Museum Hack, and you had heard about it through your wife. But Museum Hack, for those who don't know, which is most people, Museum Hack did renegade museum tours. That means that we did non-traditional live museum experiences. And here's what made them renegade, was that instead of going with a regular museum tour guide, you would go with one of my tour guides who was a stand-up comedian or a Broadway actor or a science teacher. Somebody very different that would tell you the juicy gossip and the backstories. And this became a multi-million dollar business. We had about 50 employees and we worked in major museums all across America. So I don't say that to brag, but just to put it into scale, that it turned into a mega million dollar business. I mean, for me, it was a nice little thing, right? But here's the important part. It didn't start because I wanted it to be a business. It started from a passion project. It started as a hobby. And for two years, for fun, for free, for my friends, I was just giving museum tours because I wanted to be the best museum tour guide in the whole world. And out of that passion and out of that excitement, somehow a business formed. Similarly, I don't know if you can see the thread I'm trying to draw. Similarly, I made this book because I'm so passionate about it and I saw how many benefits I got. And now I'm obsessed with trying to get 500 people to host a party, to read my book, to use my formula, to make new friends. And so that's what I'm focused on. I'm trying to get to that 500 and maybe some business will come out of it. Maybe we'll start a conference. Who knows? But for now, I'm just focused. It's just my passion. It's my hobby. And it's what I'm obsessed with. All right, we need a few listeners to organize a party so Nick can hit his number and let yes, him know. Yes, please. Please, please, please send me an email and send me your group <laughs> photo afterwards. That's, yes. I'm upset. Uh, all right, so we go through in, which is name tags, which we've covered in depth. Okay, we did never got the I, so let's go on to I. I know. <laughs> Sorry. I stands for icebreakers. To do three quick icebreakers during the party to help people create new conversations and meet new people. But there's a secret because icebreakers don't just help people start new conversations. They also help people end their conversations. Have you ever been at a party or an event and you, you talk to somebody for two or three minutes, maybe five minutes and you're like, Oh boy, I am done. I don't want to talk to this person anymore, but you're too nice. You're too courteous. So you keep talking to them and talking to them. Well, when you run icebreakers, it gives you an excuse to end the conversation. Does yes, that make sense? It does. And listeners, I will also refer you to episode, I forget which one, but I'll put it in the show notes with Gene Martinet, the author of The Art of Mingling. And uh, that was a fantastic episode where she shared some of what she's learned about exactly how to mingle. Because <laughs> I read her book and I was... It was so helpful because she talks about this specific point, some ways to, uh, you know, there's 50 ways to leave your lover. There's 50 ways to get out of an awkward or boring, you know, conversation when you're at a cocktail party. But the icebreaker gives everybody a chance to break away. And the whole point is to mingle, right? So uh, I love the icebreakers. Okay. so keep... That's amazing. And by the way, for listeners, that was um, episode 103. Oh, okay. Episode 103. I just Thank looked you. it up. Yeah. Um, okay. So icebreakers. All right. So that's – and like, so give us some examples of some good icebreakers. Well, a good icebreaker for me is just a successful icebreaker, and that means that it moves fast 
It doesn't make people feel anxious and it just circles around the room quickly. The one, again, remember, the, the, uh, I'm not trying to think of a creative icebreaker. I'm not trying to think of what's the most creative, amazing icebreaker. No, I just want one that will work well and work all the time for someone hosting a party. So I think about icebreakers as green, yellow, red level. A green level icebreaker would be something simple like, what is one of your favorite foods to eat for breakfast? Now, when you do an icebreaker, all these icebreakers have three parts. Say your name, say what you do for work, and then say your answer to the icebreaker question. So an example of how I would use that at one of my parties would be, hey, let's go around the circle, say your name, say what you do for work, and then say one of your favorite breakfast foods. I'll go first, and then we'll go around the circle this way. So that's an example of a green level. And then later in the party, once you've built up some rapport and everybody's mingling, then you could ask something like one of my favorites is uh, say a favorite piece of media that you have consumed recently. That could be a podcast like this one. It could be a book, a Netflix show, a YouTube video or even an article, a movie. Say 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 a great piece of media that you've consumed recently. And that is really exciting because everybody shares these awesome suggestions for cool stuff they've read and seen lately. What's a red level? Red level, I never do red level. Red level would be like, what's the worst first date that you've ever been on? I think that's a terrible icebreaker. Okay, so some are just like avoid them completely. And paint us a picture here. You know, this is not six people standing around at your cocktail party, but it's not 40 because that would take like an hour to do this icebreaker. What's sort of the yeah. optimal level of people that are at your cocktail party that you do this icebreaker with? The optimum level of people is between 15 to 20. If you have less than 15, then your party, it's a little bit flat. It's There's not enough energy and excitement in the room. If you have more than 20, It can be too much for a new host. It's too loud. It's too busy. It's a little too much. The icebreakers can go too long. 15 to 20 really is the sweet spot. But for someone like you who's an advanced host, I I mean, you could cruise it with 35 probably. So I actually am a little surprised by your icebreaker advice. Um, So I'll kind of very, very gently, very, very gently just challenge it, which is it's – It can be, I mean, so I, on the one hand, I like the fact that you kind of get a sense of who everybody is. That's nice. But on the other hand, it is boring. I find if Mm -hmm. a group of 15 people, when you're doing one of these, okay, let's go around the room and everybody like say your name. Cause then people are thinking, mostly thinking about, okay, what am I going to say when it gets to me? When they're not paying attention to the Mm. other 14, right? So some of the icebreakers that I tend to favor are things that are more like interactive, like, okay. I want you to go to three people and find like five things that you have in common, you know, something like Uh that. Right. And then that forces those 15 people to break up and like split it into pairs and be talking to each other more. So, um, that's That's pretty cool. Yeah. Or, you know, some kind of thing like that, like, okay, you know, go to three people, uh, you know, one per three people and do two truths and a lie or three people and, and share what you have like for breakfast, lunch, or dinner or something, but you can't be the same thing with each one. And, you know, uh, you know, or find, see if you have the same birthday as the other, someone else in this room and, or something like that, that forces like everybody to talk to someone different quickly. And then it gets it going again, you know? So anyway, that's maybe where I slightly differ from you. That's a neat idea though, to really mix it up. And I like that but I'm going to give you some pushback. That's appropriate for you as an advanced host, but not for a first time host. All right. Fair enough. Okay. So because you are an advanced <laughs> facilitator. You are an expert facilitator. I would not say you that. Have hosted, That's very generous. Well, you've hosted hundreds of events, you know, and you feel comfortable. You have to remember my book and my advice is literally about people who are so anxious that they've never hosted an event. Something is holding them back from doing that. Okay. So, I got a question for you, by the way, while we're going through icebreakers. Have you heard mm-hmm. of Project Exponential? It's a little, No, oh. no, what is that? Okay, so it's a little bit defunct, unfortunately, because 
the woman who runs it, I interviewed her on the show actually a long time ago, Michelle Welsh. She works for Seth Godin. Um, I met her when she organized a big event in New York City for Seth Godin, I think in 2010, 2011 or 12. Anyway, so for a number of years, she's now working in Nepal for the last seven or 10 years. But she uh, used to run this thing in New York where she would organize these incredible dinners. She called them Project Exponential Dinners. She'd get 12 people together, and it was so well organized. She'd do it at a restaurant. Wow. There'd be a seating chart. And then what she'd do is she would have these really beautiful, like, printed cards and collateral, like some in a little envelope with a tie on it and stuff. And then you would – it was very curated. So there'd be a first course, and then there would be an assignment. So – you would get, okay, break up into fours, and she would say, okay, you're talking now to the person on, you know, those three people, those three, and you, and each group would talk about a specific question that she had given out to you, right? And then you talk about that question, and then um, there would be, like, a group discussion about that question afterwards. And then second course comes in, everybody gets up and moves to a new seat, new seating chart, and there'd be a different question, and sometimes you'd break up into pairs or groups of four or six, Um and you really got to know other people at the table. So that was like a different thing. It was a seated dinner, but it's a way to do a seated dinner that really drives the thing. I don't know if her site is still live, Project Exponential, but you can hear some more about it in that episode I did with Michelle Welsh. So Thank you for that. That's really cool. Project Exponential. I'm going to look it up, and I love that idea of switching it up at the dinner party yeah. to move seats. That's the biggest thing. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and I have done that not as, you know, coordinated or sophisticated, but if you do have a situation where you you kind of forced to do a sit-down thing, then think about being very explicit about just, okay, you know, second course coming, let's move to different seats, half the people rotate, and it gives people new kind of partners to talk to and changes the dynamics. So anyway, let's keep going. So we got, we went through name tags, went through icebreakers. I keep interrupting you. We're on C. That's all right. What's C, C all about? So no, no, that's the problem. This is the Nick party formula. N-I-C-K. C stands for cocktails only. No food. This is not a dinner party. Snacks are okay, but this is not a dinner party. Cocktails only. I agree with you there. Yeah. Yeah. Simple but, enough. We'll move on. And then K for the end. K stands for kick them out at the end. Yes. It is only a two hour party. How do you do that for your events, by the way? So uh, there's different ways of doing it. I mean, if it's at my house, which we do events at my house as well, but like different events, um, <laughs> I start cleaning up, <laughs> you know, <laughs> people get the hint. Um, and, uh, or we just say, you know, or in some cases depends on the specific event, but in some cases say, Hey, we're ending at 10 and then it hits to be 10 or nine or whatever. I love, I love the thing in your book about scheduling it, not from seven till nine, but six fifty eight to nine Oh four. I love that. I love that. Um, so, you know, you just tell people like, Hey, we're going to wrap up. Uh, and people zero times are upset that you do that. I mean, everybody wants an excuse to leave, so they're perfectly happy. Don't feel embarrassed about kicking people out. They're they'll appreciate it. So uh, that's how we that's how we do it. Um, and, and that's one of the most important things that a yeah. new host isn't going to tune into. They're going to think, well, people are talking. I haven't seen this person in forever. And what do they end up doing? They end up spending you know five hours, and they finish the night, and it's midnight, and it's a Tuesday. And they don't get enough sleep and they wake up and their house is messy. And that may be fun in the moment, but it's not going to set you up for success to do these all the time. No. And you may have found this, that the real benefit that you unlock in your career and in your social life and in growing your business is when you make hosting a habit. There is when you become the person that can do that. I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, no, I cut you off. There is big diminishing returns after about two hours. And they, right? get, they get negative returns, right? People yes. don't. I mean, think about it the reverse. When you're at a guest at a party, usually you're not saying, oh, I really want to stay until 11 or midnight. You're kind of looking for an excuse, but you don't want to be the first to leave, right? That's embarrassing. So it's, yeah. a, it's a gift. It's a gift to your guests to say, hey, time to go. You know, yeah. it's time for bed. Um, and you can make up whatever, I mean, you can just say we're closing it and we're finished at nine. You can say, Hey, I got to go get my kids. So, you know, they're at the sitters or whatever, come up with some excuse or I got to get to bed. So everybody has to leave. Um, I want to ask you about the cocktails. So 
in terms of, I, mean, I think that's a general idea. Like, I think it's a shorthand for saying you're not going to have dinner, right? Um, but we're not saying it's just alcoholic drinks alone. You know, obviously, other kinds of drinks. Yeah. Um, let's get into some specifics. So, what are some of your favorite foods to serve um, at at a party? What are, what's some th- What are some things that you've tried that worked that work well? The my favorite things that I find that that work well are the things that take the least amount of preparation, mm. and that includes. Uh, baby carrots and hummus, chips and guacamole, salted peanuts, little snacks like that, that you can buy days or even a week in advance that do not require a lot of preparation. Because remember, my whole formula is basically the MVP, minimum viable uh, party. party. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) So that whole minimum viable party thing is what I'm trying to show people how can you make this easy? How can you make it simple? So that's big for me for the snacks. I got to say, and the drinks, even for the drinks these days, I'm telling people you don't even have to serve beer. And I want to hear your thoughts on that. Is that too controversial? Uh, It's not controversial with me. Uh, So I would say, I mean, it depends on the crowd you run in, I suppose. Now, personally, um, I'm, not like some anti-alcohol zealot, but I, I stopped drinking two years ago just because like just I just cost benefit analysis. But um, but we typically would serve wine, you know, like have some wine, yes. have some red, maybe some like yes. Prosecco. It's not that expensive. You know, some sparkling makes it feel fancy. And then um, some sparkling water is nice. Uh, yes. You know, water like soda can be a little bit you know, some people want it, expect it. It can feel a little down market. It, can, it sort of depends on what your, you know, vibe is at the thing. Um, if you're, yeah. you know, maybe serve something that's like soda like, but maybe feels a little bit fancier, perhaps like cans of what is it that uh, Italian soda company thing that just feels a little bit more special. But uh, um, it's basically, Pellegrino, maybe. Yeah, like no. Well, I was thinking, is is it the Pellegrino that's the uh, like the orangeata, whatever, you know, that kind of thing. So it feels like, oh, it's yes. a soda, but it's it's like not just, you know, Coke or something. Um, yes. And then I agree with you. I th- I like – do no, I don't like to serve food that you have to, like, eat with a fork because then you're holding a little tiny plate in your hand thing and you're eating it. Yeah. Like, stay away from lasagna or any kind of thing like that typically. More – Yep. Like maybe empanadas can be nice if they're maybe tiny empanadas, because then you can eat those with your fingers. So finger food. Finger mm. foods. Yeah. Yeah. Makes it easier because people and people will eat less than you expect. I find. They people, really do, don't yeah. they? Because they're they're not there to get like dinner, right? They're there to right. interact with each other, and so, right. you know, I mean, you can have some sweets as well, but uh, they're not really there to chow down and and have a full meal. So don't feel you have to provide that. I would say, you know, you don't mention it, but if you can afford it, it is nice if you hire a helper for your party yes. who can be there. So you as the host are not distracted trying to fill the nacho bowl or add more peanuts or whatever. Have someone else doing that, yes. you know, and that, and, you know, going around picking up the cups and everything. You know, for three or four yep. hours of help, it makes a big difference. Yes, yes. And you can even hire somebody like that. I've done it before for $20 an hour. Sure to hire somebody for two or three hours to have a spare set of hands. It's Mm. the ultimate pro move. One note that I just want to say about the booze, about the alcohol. Now I too, I don't drink alcohol. It's ironic that I wrote a book called the two hour cocktail party (laughs) and I don't drink alcohol. I do serve alcohol. So I make it available. Many people have this as a social lubricant. They want it to cool down. Maybe they just enjoy the taste of alcohol, but I will oftentimes only have wine and liquor, and I don't do beer for the following reason. Many beer drinkers are extremely brand loyal Mm, or mm. brand specific. Ah, interesting. And they have very strong thoughts. And now the new host who doesn't host, they're like, oh my God, I have to get a Pilsner. I have to get an (laughs) ale. I need to get a light beer. Now I need to cool these beers. And then at the end of the night, there's always beer bottles and beer cans everywhere. (laughs) And so I actually tell people you can host a good cocktail party with alcohol and not serve beer. In fact, I've done hundreds of them. Uh, So that's something new that, you know, 
yes, if you want to get one beer, then maybe a regional beer that 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 tends to be something. You know, you can have a six pack for somebody who insists on beer. But so I tell you what, I've hosted hundreds with no beer at all. Yeah, and I've that's an interesting point about the specific brands and types that had not occurred to me. Like, you know, usually if you get a, like a white wine, red wine, people have something, they're fine. You know, they're not there yeah. to get, you know, to have a drink really. They're there to meet other people. So people, exactly. People it's meet, not you know, about the drinks, yeah, just right? Have something it's not about, it's about the people. Yep. Yep. Okay. So let's get into some of the pre-party stuff which is some of the most important that you have a ton of experience experimenting with on the invitations so when do you send invitations how do you send invitations and who do you invite when so the first thing that you need to do if you're listening to this podcast right now and you're saying i want to do this what do i do you need to pick your date and i suggest you choose a date three weeks in advance on a monday tuesday or wednesday night why three weeks? Because that leaves you plenty of time for what I call the party runway so that you can take off with success. You can fill up your guest list. You guarantee you know you're going to have at least 15 people. Now, once you pick your date and your time, like we talked about, a two-hour window, you need a start time and an end time. Then you're going to think about, and right now you can do this, write down a list of five to ten people who you would invite first. That's what I call your core group. Your core group are people like your neighbors, your close colleagues, your best friends. They're people that you feel safe and comfortable with. What you're going to do with those five to ten people is you're going to send them a text message or shoot them an email or call them on the phone and say the following. Hey, I'm thinking of hosting a party on Tuesday night, September 10th from 7 to 9 p.m., super casual at my place. If I do it, would you come? That's what you're going to text. You're going to send that to five to 10 people and you're going to try to get five yeses, five people to say yes. Once you get five people that say yes, then you know that your date and your time are good and your party is now happening. Then you're going to create um, an event to have people um, um, RSVP to. I'm curious for you, what event platform do you use or how do you collect your RSVPs? Okay, thank you for asking. I wanna hear about your favorite platform because uh, I skipped that chapter in your book. Um, so first, I actually am curious about your approach about the tentative nature of the initial outreach as opposed to, hey, I am doing a party on September 10th. I'd love to see you there. Can you come? Why the tentative approach about I'm thinking about it? The tentative approach, again, this is hard for you because you've been hosting for you know, 10 plus years. You know that you can throw a good event. Remember, we're thinking about people that are terrified that nobody will show up. And so what they're going to do is they're going to test the waters to make sure that they can get at least five people to say yes. Sometimes it does happen that they just have happened to choose the wrong date. Okay, that fair enough. All right, they, so av right, yeah. avoid the major holidays. Look at the calendar. You know, it's not some, you know, holiday that you might not be familiar with that some people say, right. oh, yeah, oh, that's like, yeah. Anyway, so, okay, so that's, that's the nature. And we also just want to make sure that that they have a network where they can get at least five or six people who are going to say yes. Okay. Right. All right. So you got, so you get once some they get that confidence, yeah. then they have the confidence to know, Oh my gosh, yeah. this is happening. People are saying, yes, this is exciting. I'm now ready to start inviting more people. So once they get those five yeses, then they set up and they do a page to collect um, RSVPs. The one that I like is a new platform. Not many people have heard of it, but it's free and there's no ads and there's no spam. It's called Mixily, M-I-X-I-L-Y. A lot of Gen Z now are using this platform called um, Partyful, P-A-R-T-I-F-U-L. Um, I personally don't like that one, but a lot of Gen Z does. And then my parents just hosted a party and they used Evite. People use um, Paperless Post. People use Eventbrite. What do you guys use at Umbrex? So for our personal events, just 
based on kind of historical lock-in, <laughs> we've used Eventbrite to schedule some of our personal family events that we do for like when we used to use New Year's and we do this book club thing um, for our kids. So that's what we, we, we use Evite for that. For uh, yep. Umbrex events, we uh, historically used um, uh, Eventbrite. Um, nice. And that works pretty well. We My very f- the first time I did a paid event, I was just having people like email me RSVPing and then send me the funds because it was a paid event. It was three day weekend thing. And then that just became a total mess. I recommend against doing that because especially if it's a paid thing, which this is not obviously, but it, I mean, it was just a mess keeping like giving people money back and tracking who was coming and so forth. It's just, it's just, I mean, it was worth the fees to Eventbrite <laughs> to have them yes. keep track of it and be able to refund people and stuff like that. But Eventbrite, yes. it's like a little bit of a hassle for people to, if they, if it's just a casual like cocktail party at right. someone's house, it's kind of feels very formal. Like, Oh, you need to register and create an account right. and all this stuff. It's just, you know, paperless post, we, I haven't used it, but it's probably a little bit more casual if you're just inviting someone to your house for a cocktail party. I mean, <laughs> Eventbrite is way yes. overboard. Like, you must now register, give us your home address and your email and your phone number and stuff. <laughs> like, yes. Uh, so, I mean, a different, uh, I, so I haven't used the, uh, I'm going to check out Mixly and Partiful. Uh, I mean, you could use like, I mean, no, I guess, I guess, I mean, you could use like Calendly, I guess, but that would probably not be like very full featured. Um, so yeah, I like the, I, I'm going to check out the options you suggest. So Mixly, Partyful, and... Uh, Mixly, I think is my favorite. It's the okay. one I like the best. All right. So that, and, and tell us a little bit about that platform. Um, it's a free platform. It looks great on mobile. You have to remember that when you send a text message invite, most all people are going to look at this on mobile. Oh, sure, yeah. They're not going to go to their desktop. And so thinking about that, all they have to do is their name, um, email address. They can list if they're having a plus one. But here's a hack, and here's something that's important. You need to enable the guest list to be visible. You want people to see the other names of the other people who are attending. Mm. I feel strongly about that, that it's important to give social proof to your party and it also to create the social contract to get people to show up and attend. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's good. Okay. Good hack. Okay. And then we're going to get to that probably a little bit later as well. When you talk about sending out a list of who's coming with short bios so people know who's coming and then that really puts them on the hook. Yes. Yes, exactly. That's a, that's my secret hack. It's called guest bios. And the guest bios really make people excited to attend and to have new conversations and they boost your attendance rates because a lot of people, you know, they'll host something on Eventbrite or something and they'll host on Meetup or Facebook and less than half of the people who said yes actually show up, which now I'm happy to say that most everybody that's reading my book and following my method, they're getting over 95% attendance rate when they follow these steps of reminder messages and using these guest bios. That's incredible. I mean, that's an incredible, uh, you know, show rate. Um, because particularly if people are not, you know, paying for something and they just casually say yes, then, right. Then, uh, it's easy to say, Oh, you know, something came up work. I, I, you know, I'm not feeling the greatest, whatever. I don't feel like it. So that's, that's incredible. So, so tell me some more of the tricks of getting people to, um, you know, show up. Tell us about the bios. So the guest bios, it's not like a, a, a Forbes, you know, 40 under 40 list. It's simply a conversational access point. So maybe one example might be, you know, Will loves to ride bikes and drink um, herbal tea. He's a writer and an author, and he just moved here from London. Um, ask him about his bike. That's a simple little blurb about somebody that you're just going to include to make the introverts also feel welcome and excited and to know a little bit about who else is attending. So they actually show up and they start some new conversations. Yeah, that's a big help. And maybe if someone has a link, a LinkedIn profile or some yes. other kind of profile, and put a link and then you can see their face ahead of time and you get to know who's who's going. Big time. Yeah. What about, we didn't really yeah. get into it, but you, I mean, other than mentioning the idea of getting some core group and friends and so forth 
who do you invite? So in your book, you talk about getting a diverse crowd. You quote, quote uh, Joan Crawford, getting a diverse crowd, not all of the same, you know, not 15 bankers together, right? Yes, 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 exactly. Getting a mix of people. That's what's so powerful. When you mix up your social groups, your friend groups, your colleagues, that is what's powerful because they're going to get a chance to meet new people. And that's why you will become a super connector, a turbo connector, because you're going to be introducing people to new folks. And that's what's uh, that's what's so valuable and missing these days. Yeah. Um, I do want to give a shout out to Dory Clark. And we did an episode with Dory earlier this year. And she talked about how she really did a lot building her business uh, yeah. of being a consultant and uh, an author by hosting parties as well. She she doesn't take your approach. She typically does it at a restaurant, but she gets a private right. you know a private table, and she'll do a lot of the same things of sending out bios ahead of time and then connecting people afterwards and so forth. So um, so you get a diverse crowd, and then. Um, Tell me a little bit about the other you know, pieces of preparing. Anything else that you want to do ahead of time other than getting the snacks, getting the cocktail stuff, you know, getting the name tags printed up. I don't know if you print them or hand people handwrite them, but you know, what are the other preps that in, on your checklist? I'd say the last thing that folks should know and a key lesson or learning, it seems obvious again, but it's these obvious things. It's to take a group photo. You want to take a group photo of everyone attending, having fun, because one, it's going to be a great memory for you. And two, you can use that group photo to share it when you invite other people in the future to show them that you host great events and how fun it is. So that's a key thing. And most people forget it. I can tell you because they're in the moment. But taking a group photo is a key. It's a big win. All right. Social proof. Uh, fear of missing out. So let's kind of think about how could this cocktail party, you know, are there any adaptations that people would want to think about if they're saying, okay, this is great. You know, I'd love to have more friends and so forth, but yes. right in the near term, I'm sort of more like stressed or focused on doing business development, building out my business, and I'm willing to make some kind of yeah. intermediate term investments. So what are your thoughts around organizing events that are a bit more, um, I don't want to say necessarily return on investment, but but either yes. you know directly saying, okay, I'm going to organize an event where I'm going to connect five different potential clients with one another and so forth, or 15 mm -hmm. of them, or uh, you know that's a little bit more with some kind of professional angle to it. Talk to me about that. I think that you can host a networking event and use the exact same formula that I have with name tags, with group bios, with rounds of icebreakers. But I'm even going to throw a curveball and say that I've written some articles, which we can share in the show notes about, for example, how to host a clothing swap. Super casual, but a lot of women love this format. Or even how to host a book swap. These are popular. People love these ideas. For the business purposes, though, hosting a networking event for your clients, your potential clients, your customers, your employees, maybe even their family to get together, it's a huge return on investment. Yeah. And would any of your recommendations change if it's saying, hey, I want to gather, you know, and I don't want to like promote it as a networking event because that sounds like kind of, I don't know, you know, too much like passing out business cards. But let's say you're going to invite, oh, 15 business leaders together and, um, yeah. you know, uh, you know, how might you structure that or, or tell people what the purpose is and would you do different yeah. icebreakers? Maybe, you know, uh, you know, I don't know if you would make it more about business or just, or just still keep it personal. So it, so it feels a little bit more social. I love that idea because people can, when they curate their guest list, they can really get better attendees that can help them in their career, uh, um, and in their business. My first piece of advice would be host a party from my book that is simple, that's a low stakes affair for your friends and neighbors so that you can see the format and formula and give yourself the confidence that you know how to run a well-run event. Because people are going to respect you when you know how to run a good event, which I think you've probably seen. People respect you for that and they know that you're going to do a good event. So 
first, host it for your friends and neighbors. Second, when you do it for business purposes, maybe you will, for example, use the name tags that you suggested, which I think you'll link in the show notes for the magnets. They're more professional. They look crisp. Maybe you'll pre-print the names on the name tags, just like you said. Maybe you'll use a slightly more formal um, um, invitation message where you say, hey, I'm getting together some business leaders, business owners, and high-powered executives. I'd love to introduce you to some of these people I've met. Those are all little modifications you can do to make it more professional and more business or um, career-focused. Fantastic. Now, from this book coming out, Nick, tell me what has been going on with you so far. Have you been you know, now getting invited to some different kinds of parties than you had before? Have people asking for help on organizing their parties? What, what's been the impact so far? I have. I'm, I'm, I'm super lucky that I've gotten and I've heard from a lot of people. But I tell you, the, um, um, who've invited me to come and host events, for example, I'm I think I'm going to go to New York City next week to host this. Uh, a friend is having a meetup, and over 900 people signed up on RSVP, and he wants me to help wrangle that. So I'm excited about that. But the things I get real excited about are hearing from people. Like just last night, I heard from a woman, Maria, who's in Florida, and she hosted her first event. She said, years ago, I, I invited 15 people, and nobody showed up. It was traumatic for me. Oh, God. She said, I... She said, I read your book, and last night my party was a huge success. Or this guy, Darren, who's in the suburbs of Atlanta. I talked to him this morning, too. Last night he hosted his first party. Nineteen of his friends and neighbors showed up, and he said it was so easy. He said it was so easy and fun, and I can't wait to do it again. So having those conversations is really a big win for me, and I'm trying to have 500 of those conversations just to help people make more friends. I feel like it's what we need right now. Agreed. So where could people, number one, find out more about you? I think you have a URL here you can share, as well as where should people email if they want to say, hey, I had a successful party. Thanks for the thanks for the help. Oh, my gosh. Yes. The name of my book, it's called The Two Hour Cocktail Party. The um, audio book just launched. And, you know, it was really hard for me to write my book. But I tell you, the audio book was so fun to record. And you can find it online um, anywhere books and um, audiobooks are sold. Uh, I have something called my friend's newsletter, which I send out with just cool recommendations and neat hacks and business advice that I've found from starting and selling two multi-million dollar companies. And that's on my website, which is Nick Gray, N-I-C-K-G-R-A-Y dot net. And then, of course, if anyone listens to this, I hope you'll host your own party. You can just send me an email, Nick at party, P-A-R-T-Y dot pro. Um, or you can visit my website to get a free uh, um, checklist about 19 things you can do before your first event to guarantee that it'll be a success. And that includes an executive summary of my book and all that stuff. That website is www.party, P-A-R-T-Y dot pro, P-R-O. Party pro. That is awesome. All right. We will include those links in the show notes. And if I had not made it clear earlier in the show, you were giving me a lot of credit. I want to make it 100% clear that any party experience or successes that I've had is entirely 100% due to my wife, Margarita. And none, none of it is attributable to me. I am much, much the introvert. So Margarita is responsible for all our party, um, party work. So Nick, it's been great speaking with you and listeners. If you haven't already, you can visit umbrex.com slash unleashed and sign up for an email. You'll get notified of the latest episodes of this show. And if you are so inclined to give this show a five-star review, on iTunes. It helps others discover the show. Nick, thanks for joining. Thank you for having me. Party on.